Hi, my name is Amanda McGill Johnson. I'm the executive director of Nebraska Coalition for Life Saving Cures. Our mission is to promote, support, and advocate for health science research for the betterment of our health and for our economy. This is Talking Research, a, a monthly Q&A program with a scientist from here in Nebraska. And today we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Sarabi Chandra from University of Nebraska at Kearney. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Amanda. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about um, hearing more about your research. You are an associate professor of biology there at UNK, and you've chosen to do your work on diabetes and cancer, um, two very prevalent diseases. What made it motivated you to pursue this line of work? So uh, part of the uh, answer lies in your question itself that they are prevalent diseases, and that's why I chose to work with diabetes. Uh, the other uh, reason that I chose to work with diabetes is because a lot of our family members and our friends, like in everyone's family, have diabetes, uh, and that's a very common disease that is known. The problem with that is diabetes itself is not as dangerous as the complications arising from it. So from my research career has been focused a lot on the diabetic complications, I have worked on cardiovascular, that is heart-related complications with diabetes uh, during my uh, graduate studies, my PhD and postdocs. I also worked on diabetic-related renal diseases or the kidney diseases. And currently I'm working on diabetes and cancer. So my foray into diabetes and cancer was actually inspired by my research, which was just prior to this at my postdoc appointment. I was working on an enzyme that causes or leads to cardiovascular side effects with diabetes. And it's a similar enzyme that is also, effect, or also leads to cancer. And I thought, let me try this and see what impact it has on cancer because cancer is a leading cause of death uh, worldwide. And if there is a relation between the two, and in fact, that's the reason I started diabetes and cancer. And we have some really good data from that research so far. Great. So. They're so prevalent that I really hadn't considered before I heard about your research, how one really impacts the other. Um, just talk to me about what you're learning about that relationship. And it is, uh, I like that question because it's interesting that a lot of people do not know about it. However, the first scientist who actually found the correlation, he proposed it in the 1920s. So it has been there for about 100 years, but yes. It I'm behind been. the times. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like, it's not a lot of people know about it. Even maybe a lot of scientists don't know about the uh, correlation between diabetes and cancer. So the scientist who actually made this core, and he uh, did not do it between diabetes and cancer, but it was more between glucose and cancer cells. So glucose works like a fuel for the cancer cells, very much like during the winter months, how we put fuel for the fireplace. It's just like that. So glucose, the cancer cells, when they get the glucose, they just rampantly use it up and they start dividing. So they're not just using glucose for the energy. It's very interesting that they go through something known as aerobic glycolysis. And to put it in simple terms, what they are doing is they are just constantly using glucose, not just for ATP, which is the energy molecule, they are using it for making proteins and lipids and all the biomolecules so that they can just keep dividing. Okay. They also make sure that the environment, that particular tumor microenvironment, is suitable for their growth. So it is very different from the tissues surrounding the cancer. And they will uh, upregulate their uh, glucose transporters. So whatever glucose is available, they'll just try to take that in and start dividing. Okay, so it's like sugar rush in children, right? Like they like to eat sugar. That's how these cancer cells are basically. They are just taking up the glucose as much as they can and just uh, use it up for dividing. So that correlation was there and it has been shown in a lot of cancers that if they have diabetes and cancer, it leads to a very um, advanced stage of cancer. Also, the other problem is diabetes can increase the risk of cancer. So even people who do not have cancer, they can start showing uh, signs and symptoms of having a, um, like cancer prognosis later on. Yeah, I certainly have had loved yeah. ones who had them both at the same time. Right, and yeah, it's yeah. difficult to treat that just because of the complexities, yeah. Yes, um, is having cancer with type one diabetes different than cancer with type two diabetes? 
Um, again, a good question, just uh, because a lot of people don't even realize the type uh, type two. So I'll just try to define what is type one versus type two before making the link. Mm -hmm. So type one diabetes is congenital. So it is where the pancreas are not functioning. And usually it is detected right from childhood. That's when it is more prevalent and uh, detected at that time. Type two, on the other hand, is adult onset diabetes, which is caused due to overweight and uh, metabolic syndromes where there is insulin in the body, but the insulin is not functional. So what that leads to is high glucose. So there's high glucose in both conditions, type one and type two, just the difference being that insulin levels are different. So in the type one, there is no insulin. So they need to get insulin supplements. Type two, there is insulin, but it's not functional. So there's hyperinsulinemia or high insulin in the body. So uh, with respect to cancer, there's not, if you look at the numbers, you will see a difference because they are not as many type one diabetics. And I was trying to uh, uh, just, if you look at the statistics, there are about 0.5% um, type one diabetics as opposed to nine to 10% type two diabetics. So if you look into the numbers of type 1 diabetic with cancer, you would not see as many, right? But if you were trying to see as per the outcome of these disease patients, it's almost the same. So both of them get impacted the same if they have cancer. Also, as I told you, the incidence, so the chances of them getting a cancer is the same across both type 1 and type 2. So just don't go by the numbers because the numbers are deceptive in the sense because they are not as many type one diabetics, but both of them, both the uh, classes of patients have the same risk as well as the uh, chances of getting advanced stages of cancer if they have cancer. Yeah, you're right. Like I, I don't know nearly as many people with type one as That's I do. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not as many, right? So yeah, and you can see it's about like what 20 fold difference between the two. So yeah. I do want to inject for folks who are watching us live on Facebook, if you have a question, you can feel free to type that in the comment box and I will will pass that along here during the discussion. What do we know about how treatments for diabetes impact cancer and how cancer treatments like chemo may impact diabetes? Are, are there relationships there? Yeah, so uh, with diabetes, I think I'll start with some of the basic drugs that are used all over the world and then come to the cancer treatment. So I'll talk with relation to diabetes impacting cancer. So if you look at a common drug that is used, I'm starting with type two because that's more common and most people are taking, or like the people who are diabetics are taking those drugs. So one of them is metformin and commonly given as glycophage or glucophage. So if people have heard about that, that's one of the drugs that is used. Interestingly, it's really good for controlling the cancer. So, really? Yeah. So the diabetic drug metformin and in a lot of research studies, clinical trials, it has been shown to have really positive effects in controlling the cancer. So metformin is like a wonder drug right now for controlling the cancer. Yeah. It's not an anti-cancer, but it just prevents like the growth of cancer. So it's not used as a chemotherapeutic right now. The other one, which a lot of people use is in the class of the thiazolidine dions. So rosiglitazone, pioglitazone, uh, again, I'm not sure of their uh, trade names, but those are the drugs which are again given to a lot of patients. So these two classes are pretty common for the type two diabetics. And they both are actually known to reduce the cancer risk as well as the cancer advancement. So that's on the diabetes, type two diabetes. With type one, which is where they have to take insulin. So you have, might have seen people taking insulin shots and nowadays they take the insulin patches on their uh, arms. They just put it there and it automatically injects. So insulin per se is actually mitogenic. What that means is insulin causes growth of the cells. So you would think insulin should be bad for the cancer cells, right? Yeah. But if you look into the real information or the biological effect, what happens is the insulin, when it is given in the body, not when it is just generated, when it, insulin is given in the body exogenously, it has to do two effects. One thing is lowering the glucose. The other one is, of course, the other beneficial effects of insulin and in increasing the cell growth and all that other stuff, right? The effect of insulin in lowering the glucose is actually taking over than all the other side effects of insulin. So insulin is also good for controlling cancer. So 
Diabetic patients, as long as they can control their glucose, whether they are taking insulin, whether they are taking other drugs, they are really good in terms of controlling cancer. So the main thing is to control their blood glucose levels. Okay, the drugs which they are taking for diabetes will help with the cancer. So it's not that the drugs are going to impact cancer. Now, the other way around, which you asked about cancer impacting diabetes, the chemotherapeutics do not. So let's take that out of the, the question. Any drug that is known to uh, affect the cancer cells, that will not affect diabetes. What does affect is the steroids. So that is always given to the cancer patients because they get nausea. So it's not just for the killing of cancer, but the steroids are given for the other side effects that come from the chemotherapeutics. Steroids, as we all know, we have taken steroids for other diseases, like even for allergies, a lot of times they give steroid shots. The major side effects of steroids is diabetes. So it's not the chemotherapeutics, but that drug combination that is given can affect diabetic conditions. So right now, the problem with doctors or clinical, clinical uh, people who are treating these patients who have diabetes and cancer is really challenging. They have to control the diabetes. They have to give drugs for cancer. So they have to maintain levels so that their glucose does not jump up and they can also control the cancer. So it's always a challenge for those. Uh, and that's why the prognosis is so bad for these patients. What does your research look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And tell me a little bit about how students are involved in that at UNK. Uh, for that, I'll just try to first say that we are at an undergraduate institution, so we are not a research intensive institution. So it's a little different during the semester versus during the break, like summer break or winter break or even spring break for that matter. So during the semester, I do not get as much time in the lab to do research, but my students, my graduate students, undergraduate students, research techs, they are the cogwheels of my lab. They are running the lab. I do with, meet with them regularly. We have lab meetings. I keep update, uh, get update on their research. I direct them, but my hands-on research is pretty minimal. It would be about 25 to 30% during the semester. Now, when we come to the breaks, like summer break or winter break, then I do uh, that like 100% of my research time. So I do like to work in the lab. In fact, I was telling my student last week that I'm just missing that. I have to get back into the lab and do some work because we don't get time during our, when we have to teach because primary load over here uh, during our regular semester is teaching. So we spend more time on that one. So what are they working on in terms of this cancer and diabetes link? So to go very particular on what we are working on, we are actually working on breast cancer right now. And we are looking at a pathway that or signaling pathway that is affected when cells are treated with high glucose. So we're using high glucose as our treatment system and the breast cancer cells, uh, which are like a cell line, we are, not, we are not using patient populations. We are just doing it in uh, the labs, tissue culture lab. So we treat it with them and that we are looking at a pathway, it's known as a polyamine pathway. And this is the same pathway I was talking about in the heart that I was working on earlier. So we are looking at this polyamine pathway and we are trying to figure out mediators or molecules that can provide a link between high glucose and the um, proliferation or the advancement of the breast cancer. And then future, we will be probably looking at some targets or molecules that can inhibit this pathway so we can provide some treatment options for patients who are on this, uh, 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 who have both diabetes as well as breast cancer. And then my next question is, what do you hope is the ultimate outcome of your research? Is that sort of what it is providing? Some yeah, options? so yes, definitely for, uh, and again, if you know, for research, these are things that are like way down the line when you're talking about coming into practice for clinical outcomes. But our main goal right now is to figure out the target. And uh, we are actually targeting it not through chemical inhibitors, but we are using genomic approaches, which is the next, uh, I would be uh, uh, like in terms of treatment, that's the area that is being explored a lot right now, because the chemical drugs do have a lot of side effects. So we are trying to target it more on the very um, basic part at the genomic stuff, we are using microRNA uh, to target this pathway and see if we can inhibit uh, the proliferation of these cancer. 
more than that, more than just using this pathway as a, um, the ultimate outcome of my research is not just figuring this out, but also making people aware that this is something that is happening. Like a platform like this helps me to tell people that there is a link between diabetes and cancer. I've also talk, I talked to that about uh, this correlation between in my classes. So my students can then spread it out too, because a lot of people don't know about that. So they have cancer, they are taking their drugs and they don't realize they shouldn't curtail, like just stop all the glucose, like do not take any sugary fats and those type of stuff. So that's my other uh, aim, not to just benefit in terms of the medical aspect, but also create this awareness out in the society. How has the pandemic impacted your work, if it has at all? Oh, definitely it has, yeah. <laughs> so we were definitely shut down for two to three months when we had experiments right at like where people had to do the readings and they had to just shut down because everything was shut down. So those two, three months were definitely difficult for us. Um, right now, the impact that pandemic is still continuing for our research is the delays in shipping. So um, we do have a lot of problem getting materials in time and some of them like it's like six or seven months delay. We have a microscope that has been back ordered for about a year now. Whoa. So yeah, so those things are definitely impacting. It's still continuing. All the researchers are having the same problem, the shipping delays and not getting things in time. But more than the pandemic, something that really affected our campus, the science building here was a flooding that we had last year. And that was just because of a pipe outbreak. But that, def that on top of the pandemic, that just delayed our research for six to seven months. So Oh, wow. uh, thankfully, the, uh, like we had good support here. So we have things going back in place. The students are working right now. So we are going good for now. So hopefully this summer we can catch up on what we have missed so far. And I'm really relying on my students and the time that we have to catch up on that. Yeah, like what a time to be a student with all these disruptions and <laughs> wanting, I'm sure, to get that hands-on experience, but having all of these different problems. Like, right, right. And especially considering you have so many uh, setbacks and needed ways in research. So to tell them that you don't even have supplies, it's even more, yeah. Yeah, so what advice do you have for students who might be interested in pursuing careers in research, especially maybe young women who are interested in it? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I always tell my research student is perseverance. Do not think that you will get, because when they come in and especially thinking that you're working on a medical field, they think that you will have a cure right next day. That's not what is going to happen because we were working with this drug molecule. This was another project with chronic pain. And they thought by the end of the year, they will have a molecule which can be used on patients. And I had to explain, and this is not how it works. <laughs> but perseverance is really important that you continue and get excited about your results. So you might get a negative result, but that opens up your mind to think about it in a different angle. And um, I think that's a very good lesson we get from research, not just for the research experiments, but in, even in general, when, you are, you, when you get a setback for anything, you should be ready to look at it from a different angle and try to see if there is an alternative that you can go through. With women in research, what I I have a lot of women, like a more, most of my lab is uh, female students right now. Oh. And I really encourage them to pursue this as a future career, even if they are going into like a medical field, try to use research to some extent because it just gives them a different angle into any of the medications that they are using. So it's not just for women, it's just uh, like for any researcher that is out there, but for women, I really encourage them to keep pursuing it. Don't fall back just because you have family obligations or you have, uh, keep this as like your main career aim. So those things can be taken care of, but keep pursuing, keep your perseverance and try to show the society that you can actually accomplish something. So hopefully like my student just graduated, uh, she completed my first uh, undergraduate student. She just completed her PhD and I'm excited about her. And hopefully we can, I, can make, uh, I can provide more scientists like that into the society in the future as well. That's gotta be exciting to see yeah. like, <laughs> proper students go on like that. And right. yeah. uh, is there anything I missed in terms of questions um, for you about your research or any other pieces of information you'd like to share? Um, 
I think uh, you had a lot of good questions in here. So I'm glad I could provide some information on that. One thing that uh, I would just like to say, and there's like, I still don't know what uh, the pathway is, but for some reason, diabetes and prostate cancer, I'm, I know I was talking all about diabetes increasing the cancer risk and the proliferation, but in prostate cancer, diabetes is shown to be protective. And really? yes, that's a very weird. And the path, like the exact mechanism is not known so far, but it is protective. So that's my just uh, information here, like all the other cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, um, skin cancer, everything, diabetes just aggravates it, but not for the prostate cancer. So there's something in there which protects it. I don't know. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, right. thank you so much, Dr. Chandra, for joining us today. Thank and you, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for people watching, we'll be back a month from today with Dr. Peter Angeletti from UNL, and he'll be talking about cervical cancer and some of the things he's learning in that space. So uh, thank you for joining us and hope to see you again soon.